This is going to be a direct continuance of the joint health checklist for the knees and shoulders, but this time for the hips and back. We're going to open up the posterior hip capsule with the reverse hip thrust. Posterior hip capsule refers to the band of connective tissue on the back of the hip that is responsible for allowing hip flexion. If you don't have enough space in this joint, you can have more pressure in the hip, more pressure in the back, or pressure in the knees. So we really want to focus on opening up the structure. Wedge on a surface, upright posture, bend the knee, hips behind heels, back leg, toe, kiss the ground, press up with the front leg. Let your hip guide your torso angle instead of letting your torso angle guide your hip. Progress with more weight or height or both. Now, if you remember from the prior video, cartilage responds best to compression. So how do we get compression in the hip joint to adapt the hip cartilage? We use a full range seated good morning, legs spread out so that your torso can freely fall, heels in front of knees, butt back, chest out, fight to fall, coming down, full hip flexion, and explode up. Regress as needed with incline on the bench and progress as needed with dumbbell loading. Moving to the reverse RDL, this is sort of a blend between that capsular focus of the reverse hip thrust and then the traditional RDL. We're going to get that motion of the head of the hip going back in its socket and Alfred's torso doesn't bend, but you can imagine bending the torso down to get that stretch on the back of the pelvis, on the hamstring tendons and the glute tendons, forcing them to adapt. Working leg on the wedge, back leg, toes in line with the front leg's heel, the front hip up and back and lower down, bringing the back leg's heel to the ground to get opposing tension on the glute and hamstring. Lower down until your lower abs touch your thighs. Progress with weight as tolerated. Put it all together with the full range RDO with chains for a functional application of all those prior structures. For the back, it's a little bit different, but it's not too confusing. From the capsular viewpoint, we have facets, and I'll zoom in on the video. Facets are just the articulations between adjacent vertebrae within the spine. You have your cervical vertebrae, your thoracic vertebrae, your lumbar vertebrae, and your sacral. From the front, we can begin working the anterior portion of those articulations in thoracic extension with the cross bench pullover. Regress the exercise with less weight or progress with more weight. Now from the back, we can begin working thoraco lumbar flexion with the Jefferson curl. This movement will help open up the posterior portion of those articulations and you can simply decrease the difficulty by just changing your body weight and increase the difficulty by using more weight. Those motions will also work the various tendons and muscles and ligaments on the front and the back of the spine. Now the big difference between the spine and the extremities is the focus on the intervertebral discs. These structures provide cushioning between each spinal segment, much like the meniscus provides cushioning to the knee. It's a very controversial topic on whether or not it's safe to put loading on these structures, and it's not my job to make an authoritative statement on if it is or not, but it is my responsibility to ensure I'm sharing the truth about what the science says about loading these structures. When these structures are simulated, they will attract water into themselves to offset future forces, much like the meniscus water cells do in a video I've explained about in the past. The intervertebral discs also have the capacity to adaptively strengthen and heal over time, with moderate loads promoting an anabolic shift to the extracellular matrix, increasing cellular activity, increasing tissue remodeling, and strength of the disc. And when injured, they can even spontaneously heal over time. The opposing argument says that in other studies, increase in flexion or compression on the discs leads to damage. The one thing to consider about that line of thought is that they were done on cadaveric tissue. In a great quote, cadaveric tissue does not have the capacity to adapt. Is it safe to load these structures? I would conclude it is safe to load these structures moderately according to one's tolerance. My moderate is about 100 pounds. Your moderate might be something else. Let's put it this way. Alfred has no connective tissue. 
If I tried to force him into spinal flexion with 100 pounds on his back, do you think that he would snap or not? <laughs> Correct, he would snap. So just keep that in mind when considering whether or not it's safe to load the lumbar discs.